welcome to this new nutrition business podcast. My name is Julian Mallettin, and today I'm having a conversation with someone who comes from a world that doesn't always get heard very often, and that's the world of food science. Um, Paul Hart um, has a 25, or 30 year Paul. I regret to say it's uh, actually 40 plus. Oh, is it? Okay, right. Okay, you're looking younger than that, I have to say. Uh, 40 years of experience working in the world of food science and is a particular expert in plant proteins. And as we all know, uh, plant-based is top of mind for food companies and it's top of mind for consumers. So it seems to make sense to get someone in who we can have a chat to about the pros and cons of the plant-based products that are being pushed so aggressively in the marketplace today. Good morning, Paul. How are you? Uh, thank you, Julian, for your kind invitation. Yes, uh, under lockdown, doing okay. Okay, uh, could you say a little bit more about yourself? Because I think what I said was probably quite inadequate. Yeah, okay. I, I, I was actually a direct entrant to Unilever, direct from store, which explains a few of those 40 years, uh, and started in ice cream and dairy section, and, and, and my understanding dairy proteins and dairy science. I then worked as, I moved into background science. I didn't move out into the companies on NPD. I moved into sort of the big R end of things, corporate research, uh, and joined the tail end of their world-class group, which elucidated the, the structure and function relationships and gelling behavior of many of the, what are now well-known gums and stabilizers. For example, uh, the group had elucidated the structure of xanthan, gelling behavior, carrageenan, alginate, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the work led ultimately to colleagues who were working on adjacent benches uh, in, in the mid eighties uh, on the low fat spreads programs and very low fat spreads and even zero fat spreads where water structuring was controlled down to a minimum um, of, of fat and, and to give a spreadable consistency of something which by the time it was zero fat was neither butter nor margarine, one has to say, or a low fat spread. Sounds delicious. Um, uh, well, it, look, it, it, it had its day because it met the dietetic mantra of saturated fats are bad for you. Polyunsaturated fats are good for heart health because they seem to show a low LDL. Um, they reduce it. After that, I moved into dalliance with marketing schemes, uh, moved into corporate communications and ran the external affairs and then corporate comms, small unit, uh, reporting to the board for communications internally but also taking a role on external communications and what we could say to stakeholders. I then joined AVB in the Netherlands, but home based in the UK, pioneering the introduction of their marvellous Solanic potato protein, which is the, uh, the new vegetal egg white in terms of functionality and the new vegetal whey in terms of um, nutritional um, profile. It's somewhat of a platinum standard amongst plant proteins because it's uh, eternally soluble. Um, you know, 95% um, purity and, and 25% solutions can readily be made of this uh, material. So you've, you've had all these, these years of experience in proteins, plant proteins, and that's why you know, we decided to have this conversation, because at the moment, the meat substitutes and all the alternative proteins um, are getting lots of media attention, the industry's focused on them, and the most recent you know, Beyond Meat announced a partnership with PepsiCo, um, which supposedly is going to see PepsiCo launching products based on Beyond Meat's technology, perhaps, um, and taking them to the world in a way they couldn't before. So, Paul, what do you think about the, the plant-based trend? Okay, so just, just go on picking plant-based for a moment. What is it with, with plant-based? I mean, I was looking at um, plant proteins, uh, end of the noughties into the early teens, and, and, and plant-based wasn't really a thing then. Um, and indeed, if you if you looked at the world of ingredients, uh, animal proteins, the dairy industry, milk, eggs, butter, uh, and all the dry products that come from those, casein, whey, dry egg white, whatever, liquid egg white, once you got outside of, of, of that dairy sector, pretty much all ingredients ever were plant-based. Um, what can we think of? We can think of flour, we can think of chocolate, we can think of vegetable fats, nuts. The thing about plant-based is how can we deliver a product which has really 100% plant ingredients? And ultimately, the challenge is around the functional protein aspect. So if you take an egg, it's soluble, it foams, it emulsifies a bit, and you can certainly make a jolly good quiche from, a, from an egg. However, uh, what you discover with your plant-based milk is that there's often a layer of something on the bottom that's not in solution. Uh, and this then leads to a consideration of a sort of uh, functional hierarchy 
of these vital plant-based proteins because they don't they don't all have this functional effect typically there are two aspects to a plant-based protein there's the bulk protein which will give you uh, a dial up on your macronutrient uh, protein level uh, and they'll be used at uh, say up to four to twelve percent something like that but then there are these functional proteins which work really well in terms of structure texture taste and, and often have a high value the problem is anything that nature has um, turned into a seed or a nut uh, in the first place um, majors on insolubility and low functionality. That, that's how it is. Um, right. Sprouted grains or fermented grains in some way might be better. So just going through the hierarchy from, from, from uh, the bottom end towards the top, um, you've got fermented proteins from algae or yeast or whatever, uh, and indeed uh, insoluble potato protein that many of the starch companies will, will produce for animal feed. Um, they don't do anything because they've been sterilized, they've been cooked. Uh, you know, it's like cooked egg white. There's, there's a limit to what you can do with cooked egg white. Right. Then you've got your cereal proteins, which come in vast amounts. Um, wheat, like gluten, wheat protein, for example. Yeah. Wheat gluten, yes, is yeah. a classic. But oat uh, is popular currently because it's um, it doesn't bring with it wheat intolerance uh, and, and, and the problem for celiacs. So we then get the concept of allergen-free. Then you've got oilseed press cakes, and the whole industry of plant proteins is, is of course, soy, whether we like it or not. That is the industry. Um, but uh, it often involves uh, severe heat treatments and, of course, solvent extraction of the oil. But we've got the, the new kids on the block, like canola, hemp, and to a lesser extent, sunflower coming along. Mm -hmm. But then we've got the new soy, which would be uh, yellow split pea protein. Don't illustrate it with green garden peas. We see that all the time. That, that, that's a nonsense. It's an easy mistake for people to make, isn't it? Yeah, and, and anybody so we're not, not talking green garden peas grown in some charming field somewhere. We're talking yellow split peas grown on the prairies of Canada and the United States as, as industrial monocrops in order to keep the price down. Exactly. Yellow okay. split peas, yes. And we, we can discuss that um, supply chain in a few minutes. The, the reason why this is the new soy and it, it, it is because it's, it's not an allergen it, and it doesn't have quite the issues around trypsin inhibition activity. and Which is what? Ah, well, every protein that you want to use from the plant protein kingdom comes with an anti-nutritional factor. So red kidney beans have got phytoglutinin and whatever the product is, the protein that's toxic, and, and you have to soak them. So... In, in uh, Asia, the historic um, ancestral way of dealing with soy is to ferment it. Yeah. No problems. Uh, the idea of using soybeans directly and then feeding them to humans uh, can bring with it some of the things that you, you, you may not need. Um, so trypsin inhibition activity, which is a little protein that blocks proteases in your gut and limits uh, protein uptake is one of them. Unless so just, sorry, just to, to, for clarity, so the trypsin inhibitor comes with the soy. If the soy I'm eating protein. hasn't yeah. been fermented... Yeah. In my gut, it's going to make it more difficult for my body to absorb the, pro the components of the protein. This can be an issue if the product has not had a high temperature treatment to denature the trypsin ah, inhibition okay. activity. So you cook it. So uh, yeah, manufacturer gives the high treatment that takes down the trypsin inhibition. But is it still is it still a natural protein with all the right things in it? Uh, well, I mean, it, 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 you would call it a denatured protein. The the amino acid profile will still be good for nutrition. It's yeah. just that you have limited the. By, by the way, by the way, just before we get too, too engrossed in the, the difficulties, if you look at the uh, protein activity in something humble like egg white, it is yeah. vast and extensive, straight out of the egg. If you take it, uh, in, in, if you take it naturally, there it is. Right. Uh, the cooking denatures the protein yeah. the heat treatment will denature it cooking will denature it and yeah. you end up then with uh, something that doesn't have all the bioactivity of the native natural protein now when we come we come to plants we mentioned that we're on the soy side of things ancestral diet culture soy is fermented that will deal with some of these problems through simply producing a hydrolysate and an enzymic digestion and the the enzymes from the bacteria or whatever Heat will do it, will provide the denaturing. But if you eat raw soybeans or you drink uh, three quarts of uh, soy milk a day, there's a, there's a story in the scientific press, then you get issues around trypsin inhibition uh, activity intake and, of course, phytoestrogens, female hormones, which is not good for you if you're male. That's uh, mm -hmm. I've said. So the do dose is always the poison. Uh, and that's not to diss soy, but it's just to say, look, this is all understood yeah. by the industry. It's how the chemistry it, works. Yeah. It's how the chemistry works. People understand this. There's normally a level of safety with these things once you move away from doing things in a traditional way, which is why pea protein, people think of green garden peas, as you, you correctly said, 
even though it's not. So it, it's seen as warm and friendly. It, it, it doesn't have uh, quite the level of trypsin inhibition activity. There are some nutritional factors, in it, but you won't go into that now, but um, it doesn't have the allergenicity because it hasn't had the years of exposure. Now, that may come if P becomes very broadly propositioned in the market, more people will develop exposure to it. Some will develop an intolerance and, and, and a lesser number will become allergic. But there's plenty more where P came from. Uh, and by the way, legume protein was declared an allergen around about 2010-11. So P moves on from that. But there's also faba bean, the broad bean, and then there's also mung beans as well. They've got a position around some functionality. They don't gel particularly well. And there's often a beany taint. Uh, fermentation in Asia, again, with these proteins will uh, lead to less taint and whatever, but you're then dealing with a hydrolysate. You're not dealing with a, with, a, with a native natural protein. And then we come down to the high functionality proteins where you're using clean, green, modern separation technologies that don't involve so much heat to give you this uh, wonderful plant protein that is uh, exceptionally functional. But you're not going to put that into a product as the bulk macronutrient, you're only going to put that in there about 1% to 2%, or oh, as much as you use an egg white to create bones. You're going to use a very, very minimal amount. Your macronutrient profile, take a gluten-free bread, for example, in a normal, regular, conventional loaf, 10% of its gluten, 10% protein. Not many gluten-free loaves tend to have such high levels of plant-based protein because it's expensive, and also it, it starts to do other things within the formulation. Mm, I see. Right. That's interesting. Okay. So if I am a company who wants to give more plant proteins to my customers, or I'm a consumer who wants to consume more proteins and convenient things, you know, like breads and cookies and snacks, it sounds like you're saying it's not as easy to get quality protein that way as it would be if I was using an animal source protein. Would that be, would that be a fair I assessment? Think that, I, think, I think that's correct. Um, and the gluten-free market is one that was starting to burgeon around about 2010 when some of the first convenience just simply poly wrapped products that were on the same shelf as regular products came to the market and genius in scotland did that um before that there was a history of um what i call bulletproof packaging for stuff that you got from pharmacies with sort of an mm-hmm. eternal shelf life that had to be either microwaved or baked off but of, of many of the new wave of gluten-free products their macronutrient profile does not match that of conventional and that's the 10% protein that you find, or 10 to 12, 12% protein in, in a good baker's loaf. Um, now, the functional protein that's often been adopted by the gluten-free industry has been egg white. But of course, that you're swapping one allergen, wheat gluten, for another. Trying to get functional protein that will work well in, in um, a gluten-free system is, is tricky. And there's been a lot of dependence, therefore, on gums and stabilizers, the, the, the ubiquitous mm-hmm. uh, psyllium husk and others, because it sounds natural and it's good, rather than a complicated blend of uh, E-numbers, uh, to give you um, something approaching and acceptable uh, bread crumb texture and structure. Okay. So, um, and then if I'm a company looking, thinking about why am, I, why am I not getting into selling, you know, sausages and burgers based on these plant proteins, because I read everywhere, that's what consumers want. You know, we're told all the time people have to eat less meat, consume more plants. Surely, if some of these proteins like pea and soy are widely available and they're currently widely consumed. You know, that, that's the route you know, that, that an awful lot of businesses take is just to use those. Is there yeah, anything, I, any drawbacks to that? Anything wrong with that? I think, I think so. I mean, I think soy products have had a fairly long history as, as meat alternatives. What we've got now is something that um, through the ubiquity of the big burger chains is a meat format, if we can call it that, the burger, yeah. which is international, global, um, doesn't respect local cuisine, and to produce something homogenous mm. uh, without the texture, structure, functions of, say, shall we say, a ribeye steak, if we just produce something that's homogenous like a burger, then we've got something that we might term a plant burger that, that, that for meat eaters might match the taste and texture of uh, a, a ground beef burger. I say might because um, it depends. Now, who's the market for these? It, why would vegans want something that looks like a meat burger? Uh, my suspicion is they probably don't. What's going on here is something to appeal to the 15% of the market, and you'd know more about this than me, Julian, uh, uh, the flexitarians. Yeah. You feel a bit guilty about meat, eating meat and will want to do so or, you know, on a Monday, a meat-free Monday, or, or go meat-free after Christmas with the January. But do they have the taste and texture of meat 
to some extent, but not necessarily thoroughly convincingly, but they're on the market. Now, unlike a composite modern food like margarine, which was a lot cheaper than butter, uh, these things are vastly more expensive than um, ground beef. And there are two companies slugging it out at the moment in, in, in the USA. One is Impossible and the other is uh, Beyond. And we have the uh, many of the previous remarks that we've, we've commented upon uh, encapsulated in these two companies. The Impossible Burger is based on soy and is extending into Asia and depends very much for its colour on uh, a yeast fermented soy leg hemoglobin. So now, that, that, that hemoglobin gives it the kind of blood look. And when people bite into it, a kind of blood-like substance runs out, which is something yeah. that they've, they've boasted a lot about in their PR in recent years. Yeah. The Impossible uh, Burger um, in, in European markets is not here yet because the EFSA, European Food Standards Agency, need to consider a safety dossier for the GMO soy. And, and by and large, GMO ingredients and public consumption are not a thing in the UK and Europe. No, in fact, they're a big, big red flag to a huge number of consumers. So that'll be interesting if they try and market it using a GMO-based ingredient, which they would have to label, I guess. The, the, the Beyond Burger, however, that uses uh, pea protein, and that is uh, extended into the European market, and it's here in Tesco. That it was a slightly more benign way of doing things, and um, uh, has a broad acceptance in, in, in that sense. So the building blocks of protein. So what we're talking about here is protein. You know, the animal protein through a beef burger or plant protein through a Beyond Burger. But the building blocks of protein, which people who do sports and fitness are increasingly aware of, are the essential amino acids. Yep, that's the, the things that your body absorbs that helps keep your muscles strong and in good shape. And that's one of the reasons that you know, sales of products containing protein, be it Greek yogurt or whatever, have gone up a lot over the past 10 years. There's this growing awareness that consuming protein you know, helps you keep your body in good shape and keeps the weight off and all that kind of thing. It's the nutrient that can do no wrong. Is there any difference between the quality of the protein in one of these pea protein-based burgers and the quality of the protein in, say, dairy or egg or, or meat? Uh, isn't it exactly the same or is it different? It, it tends to have a different amino acid profile and different availability. So there's, there's two things that we're considering here. Soy is, is, is a technically complete protein and pea similarly. But pea protein is, uh, has only about 50% in terms of uh, what the World Health Organization would recommend in terms of amino acid intake at various life stages. And that's yeah. the sort of nutritional plan on which these remarks are based. Yeah. Um, um, pea has only about 50% of the required sulfur amino acids. That's methionine, methionine and cysteine. But as you're probably aware... And what's particular about those? Why do you mention those? Uh, well, they're, they're, sul they're the sulfur ones. And if you can then balance a, a legume with something that's, uh, let's say, lower in lysine, like a cereal protein, but cereal proteins tend to be high in the sulfur ones, you, you get a pretty even profile. Now, oddly enough, most, uh, again, ancestral cultures or even recent cultures have a, have a cuisine regionally where you have uh, beans and cereals taken together. So beans on toast in the UK, pasta and beans in Italy, dal and rice in India, et cetera, et cetera. Most, most cultures uh, have something like that. So but that's a kind of tra traditional way of eating which produces the right balance of amino acids that your yeah. body needs. Long before people even knew there was such a thing as amino acids, they'd figured out that having these very different types of plant proteins together was what worked for you. Is that, that, is that seems, essentially what that you're seems, saying? Yeah, that seems to yeah. produce a, 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 a healthy result without any deficiency issues. In plant-based burgers, ah, there doesn't seem to be this exquisite blend in quite the same way. It's either all soy and not much else, or all pea protein and not much else. So immediately you will have something that's going to be out of whack with respect to a steak or yeah. dairy protein. When you when you have ground beef, you, you might buy 20% fat ground beef and you know what you're getting. It's one ingredient. You might make a patty from that and cook it. You might add some um, blending spices in and salt or whatever. But it, 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 it's, it's very, very minimal. When we start to look at the uh, ingredient profile of some of these things, this is a slightly, a slightly odd thing. The Impossible Burger has something in the region of 20 ingredients and, and and beyond for a while uh, in earlier formulations had over 20. So you, you're getting right. towards two dozen ingredients to make something similar. And these are not sort of kitchen cupboard ingredients. Uh, one thing that occurs to me is just that consumers have been telling us for the past 20 years they want ingredient lists to be as short as possible and as, you know, as natural as possible. And this seems to run up against this desire that consumers have, have had, which has created the clean label trend for, you know, 
five ingredients, maybe 10 at the very most. This is quite a different way of coming at things from, from what consumers say they've wanted. All of these ingredients have a supply chain. All of them have a producer base somewhere, a raw material call from somewhere else. Uh, and, and, and then there's the transportation element to bring them all together. And it's, it's just worth reflecting on that for pea protein. Before pea really became a big thing, it was grown in Canada. There was a supply chain from Canada across to Yantai province, um, or Shandong province, Yantai and Shandong province in, in China. When the mung bean price was expensive, they found they could use the pea starch, yellow split pea starch, or glass noodles, these translucent, very fine noodles that they enjoy in some mm. of them seen. So when you got rid of the starch, you then got an issue of uh, fibre from the pea hum and then the uh, pea protein that's left. Well, what happened then to start was this pea protein went back to USA and markets were found um, for it with uh, American distributors, USA distributors. Uh, and that was the early phase from like 2010, 2015. Um, and it started to gain traction. Yeah, but, so if I can just uh, interrupt you there just for a second. Um, so w- pea protein, these things are presented as being the more environmentally sustainable option. But essentially what happens is they're produced in, in huge prairies in Canada, shipped to China in order that the starch can be pulled out f- to make noodles, and then shipped all the way back around the world again in order for the, the, the finished protein that's left comes all the way back around the world for us to add into burgers, essentially. Uh, that, is, that is a problem. Um, I'm also aware that um, even if the crops are not ground up ready, glyphosate might be sprayed to improve drying and sharpen up the harvest period. So the, the, yeah. there's a pesticide demand and, and other things there if you're generating a monoculture. I, I just bring that up because, you know, the, one of the, the strong positioning that a lot of people or, or rationales people have for going to, say, plant-based burgers is it's obviously the environmentally superior choice. Now, I don't know what the numbers are, but I have a suspicion that the CO2 that's needed to ship crops halfway around the world to China process them in a Chinese factory. And as we know, China doesn't always have exactly the same environmental standards as other countries, then ship them back again. I'd be really surprised if all of that is taken into the equation when it comes to assessing what the environmental impact of these things is. Well, uh, exactly so. And, and just on um, how China does this, typically they, they hydrolyze the protein to remove the taint. And what you're buying is it, it's, it's a very good product, let's say, but it, it will be a hydrolyzer. Um, yeah. It won't necessarily be the native natural protein in that way. So that, that's countered by um, uh, air fractionation, which is essentially a bit like a Dyson Hoover, where the protein and starch and, and fiber are spun out at different levels. Mm-hmm. But the purity is not so high. And then we have other uh, companies uh, like Merritt and Burkhan who are looking at uh, um, modern separation techniques to, to give um, much which higher is the, purity. the more green approach you were mentioning. Something you mentioned before was about the relatively high cost of some of the plant-based burgers, or all of them pretty much, compared to the thing they're competing with, which is which is the beef burger, and you've read out a long ingredient list. Now, what is the standing in the way of companies cutting the price of their plant-based burgers in order to you know, persuade more people to switch over? Because there'll be a lot of people who look at the price, they'll go, you know, I kind of like the plant-based idea, but it's twice as expensive. Is there anything they can, is there anything standing in the way of them cutting the price? Yeah, well, you, uh, a lot of people would look at these lists and go, "Oh, these are all cheap industrial ingredients. Surely, if they're cobbling something together, they can they can make it cheap." What do you think? Yeah, that, that that's a it's a great sentiment, and it's very easily understood, and it's broadly correct. But let, let's approach this another way. You've got a very long ingredient inventory. As a producer, that all has its supply chain. It has to have its warehouse management. It's just in kind of delivery of how you how you do it. Depending on the size of your production, if you're a small producer, you'll be buying in banks. Uh, on pallets and collectively from distributors who will have their own markup. If you're big enough to be having your a full container load delivered to your factory 24 hours, seven days a week, you, you'll be getting a discount, sure, and you'll be having an annual contract that will give you a discount. So if you take a date and price, um, a distributor will have a markup, 5, 10, 15, 20%, whatever. You know, bags you'll be paying through the nose for, consolidated pallets you'll be paying less, Mm-hmm. But direct from the manufacturer for container loads will, will be better. So let's think about this from the point of view of you know, what you're a company who you really want to take market share away from animal based proteins. You're able to get the best possible price. Okay, so they've got that. that. What is stopping we, them from transferring that into a much cheaper product? If we if we look at that, we've still got twenty ingredients to price up. Some of them you'll be buying by the full container. Some of the flavors, you know, the packet will do many months of. 
infrastructure, let's say, like big banks. But then we have the cost of all these, and and, and brown beef is a key note, but it, it's not going to be huge. Um, but when we look at some of these, um, and I did do a cost iteration on the Beyond formula uh, about 10 days ago, if we look at the nutritional profile and the list of ingredients, you can hazard a guess pretty much how much e protein is going in there. They tell us that actually, 16%. And you know where salt is on the ingredient declaration. That fixes another point because everything below that is going to be of that order of percentage or less. And, and you, you, you put up a bit of a cock shot. He won't be right in all of its particulars, but it'll be generally true. And you look up the commodity prices for these things, and, and, and maybe we can, we can argue the shipping. Um, you find there's a lot of things with um, a price of about £1.20 per kilo, all added together. Um, well, that's about 14 pence a burger, just in raw material costs. This doesn't take account of the shipping of the burger, the supply chain, the factory overheads. The yeah, the huge costs. factory costs, yeah. No, yeah. None of that. This is just the ingredient cost. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and what, what you find is, uh, in Tesco, they're selling it for four pound forty for twenty two hundred twenty six grams. That's roughly twenty pounds a kilo. Mm. Well, when Tesco have got a deal on sirloin steak, it will be ten pound a kilo. Now we can argue whether it's grown in Brazil or wherever, but I mean, it, it well, you can it. buy a UK or sirloin steak for that sort of price. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, or, or, so so yeah. I mean, what what, we, what we're saying now is that we've got something that, in a nutritional equivalent, it, it, by, it, by cost, it, is not that a ground beef. It's it's more like Prime state. So, just just thinking about this one. Okay, the mantra you're told is: as these companies get bigger, and we're going to supplant the meat supply by 2030 or 2035, whatever it is. That's or, the date that some of them claim. Yeah, the guy yeah. that runs Impossible Foods has what, said. What, what, how, is it, how is this going to happen when you're twice the price, and you, you you've got a protein level that's much le- much less than 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 what you've got in 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 your prime state? How is this going to work? Yeah. So the total protein for a burger compared to a steak would be, what, half what you would get in a steak? It's looking like that, isn't it, from from the data I put up on Twitter last week. And I haven't got precise figures right in front of me now, but it it was a surprising comparison, shall we say. And and, and we found that corn and we found impossible and beyond are all much lesser than, than the price point in the market of the steak equivalent. Yeah. So animal, natural animal protein at the moment is much cheaper per gram of protein that you buy right. than some one of than the one of those factory produced alternative proteins. Then we're told, but this is all going to get cheaper because we're going to scale. Yeah, well, let me tell you, if you create demand for something, more people will enter the market, and what you previously could get becomes unobtainable. And I've got a real story on that, as you know, uh, on something else. So the fact that there's uh, more people seeking demand because you're having a good time in that sector, doesn't mean that prices will drop eternally. And the other thing is, you know, by the time you've gone direct to the manufacturer and paired out the distributor middleman and you, you've got the packaging efficiency of no bags, no pallets, but just the full container load, if you can order plenty of containers a year and get their factory really buzzing because you've got that level of offtake, you know, you'll get a 20 30% discount, but it ain't going to drop to half that. Yeah. It's the point. Yeah. So some of the companies like Impossible have announced they're cutting their price by 20% and then they cut it 20% again. And what was notable about Beyond is in the US, their sales, I think, pretty much doubled compared to last year, but their losses increased sevenfold. So they, so their sales doubled, but their financial losses went from 3 million in a quarter to 20 million in a quarter. Now, what the mechanics are of, I double my sales volume, but I also massively increase the amount of money I'm losing every single year. Now, that, that's, that's not supposed to be how the food industry works, is it? I mean, that's traditionally people pushed for more volume because it lowered the cost and enabled them to compete and, and actually you know, make, some sort of, make some sort of profit. But this doesn't seem to be working yet with these people. Um, and why would it? With complex ingredient inventories, many of them are, um, some of them are commodities to be sure, but some yeah. of them are functional specialities and, and, and there's, a, there's a competitive market out there. You won't get much change um, on those. Um, everybody wants to pile in and look for the same sorts of things if you're having a good time. You will get a, a reduction through scale, but I, I just can't see any time soon the ingredient prices falling to a fraction of what they are now. So this £19.50 per kilo, roughly, for what Tesco are charging, well, let's say a Beyond Burger, 
it, you know, if, if there's 40 to 50 percent profit in there, we're, we're sort of down to 12 pounds to ship this thing from wherever it's made. Mm. Uh, the one pound 20 ingredients mm. are beyond profit, which will probably be, let's say, 30 percent of that. Um, so that takes you down from 12 to nine. You've got one pound 20 ingredients, that's eight, seven pound 80. You've got seven pound 80 then to, 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 to go into uh, beyond overheads. Yeah, which is a lot of marketing, probably. Yes, and yes. a lot of them are spending money on what they call R and D, um, which you might also call new product development, more correctly. So they're throwing lots of money at trying to improve the existing products and to come out with new ones. But you think that's a whole other question. Then we talk about investing in improving the existing products. You've been through the ingredient list, but you know one of the obvious differences, isn't it, between some of these. Uh, plant-based burgers and their animal protein alternative you know you look for the presence of iron in the uh, plant-based burger and it's it's either tiny or non-existent most of them and you know anemia is an issue it's an issue for lots of women of reproductive age i even have a colleague who has avoided eating red meat for 15 years and has ended up being hospitalized because of iron deficiency and that is increasingly common so in new zealand for example you know women with iron deficiency are a, a real issue and then you have all the other nutrients that you might get in in an animal based protein which just don't seem to be present in these so i'm guessing they're going to have to spend even more money fortifying the products with bought in iron and bought in b12 and all the other things you'd expect to get from a from an animal source protein yes, in, in front of me i've got a slide here which um um the the the, the beyond the impossible burger we, we, we mentioned about the soy issues They've thought a bit about the micronutrient aspect. So, so just to make a, a, a top long point, of this new plant-based burger, how does the macronutrient, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats element that it will sit with conventionally, which is beef burger or steak in the phosphates? Yeah. But what about the micronutrient profile? Where are we there? The Impossible Burger, um, uh, I am pleased to tell you, inform you, Julian, has um, uh, zinc... It has thymine, vitamin B1, uh, sodium ascorbate for vitamin C, niacin, uh, um, pyridoxine, hydrochloride, vitamin B6, riboflavin, B2, and of course, cyanocobalamin, B12. So th they thought about this and they've put in a micronutrient pack to, to maintain parity. Now, I, I haven't done a study on how close that is to steak or ground beef, but okay, the, 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 there is a swathe of this stuff in there, but yeah, not, not you... in the Beyond Bug. Yeah, because if I can just just interrupt there, Paul, but what they've had to do then is they've had to buy in a bag of powders which has been blended to contain all of these things, and it's another ingredient added into the mix. Almost none of these, these things are not going to be naturally present in the ingredient list that you've read out to me before. Well, they're, they're not in the shelf in my kitchen or many people's kitchen, I know, with the possible exception of vitamin C. And maybe you might have some zinc in your supplement cupboard or wherever you keep those. But okay, the, the point is... Well, these things to give you the level in a burger. This is another point just to just to, to clock on here. You don't have a scoop and a big tub of maltodextrin and gave you toss it into your ice cream premix. No, it's not like that. <laughs> I these might give things, that a try sometime. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, these things these things are pudding in in sniffs and featherweight quantities on, on sort of like microgram balances, and they're impossible to weigh with kilo balances. So what, to make life easy for a producer, what you have is you you go off to whoever your blender is. For vitamin producing uh, and say look i want the blend to give me this much to give me this level of um uh, overage because you have to have an overage for cook losses and all the rest of you know, and shelf blah 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 but i want this um blend to give me this um vitamin or mineral profile um mix it up for me i, I can then take that and apply that but that can then that will probably come with some sort of excipient like starch or whatever and that can easily be um weighed and dosed into each formulation uh, or, you know, for very big, for very big productions, it might come in, in a bag and you just unzip the bag and throw the contents yeah. of the bag in and, uh, and you've got what you want. But to weigh so, out individually, uh, yeah. that again is, 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 is annoying. Yeah. So as a, as a, someone making beyond uh, your plant based burgers, you buy in a bag of the stuff you want that's going to improve the micronutrient profile. That's great for someone who's very motivated by seeing those things on the package. You know, like I see that you know, Beyond has, has got a new variant that provides 20% of your daily value of iron. But at the end of the day, what you're buying is something that is basically increasingly processed. So I might not have added those vitamins in my factory, but I've paid someone else in their factory to put all those vitamins together. I'm just conscious of the fact that consumers are constantly telling us they'd like things to be as natural and intrinsic to the product as possible. 
and then we're offering something to them which is, is marked as being a healthier choice, but it's really all about using factories to bring all of these items together and assemble them, essentially. Yeah. We've got something which looks like long ingredient list. Okay, they're trying to improve it. It doesn't come with a natural package of nutrients. Okay, they can chuck some nutrients in to make it equivalent to an animal protein. It's an alternative. It's a plant-based protein, but clearly some of the building blocks of that protein, the amino acids, are just not present at the same level that you would get from an animal protein. So the, the question is, what, can they, what, what do you think the next generation is going to be? What's the next step in order to make these products you know, deliver better on nutrition, deliver better on the amino acid content, uh, be less processed? What's, what, what happens next? Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to gluten-free and say that was the blind test run from about 10 or 12 years ago, um, where you take one functional protein out of something that's a conventional um, food, staple bread, you take the gluten out and, 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 you know, hope with that sunshine. Yeah, okay, so how do we cope with it? We add egg and we, we try and find other things or gums and stabilizers. So it gets worse before it gets better because the, the, the first thing that convenience gluten-free bread showed in much the same way that these uh, burgers are shown is that um, there can be improvements in taste and texture that their company proponents will say are getting close to the taste and texture experience of uh, a red meat burger. Now, we can debate how accurate that is, but, but that's, that's roughly where we are. You've got taste and texture that's sufficiently well developed, um, as our remote head of consumer science once saying, if the hand doesn't go out the second time in the supermarket aisle to make a repeat purchase, you have no business. So mm -hmm. they have a business, it would appear. People are buying twice. Yeah. Ah, so some of the concerns that we've been discussing, uh, over-elaborate supply chains, so there's a sustainability uh, issue in food miles. On, we've also looked at the nutrient profile of the macronutrient from the point of view of protein. And we, we had a discussion around micronutrients. These need to match or mirror conventional, ideally, ideally. Um, but then we were up against something else, which is um, some of the dictates of, 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 or suggestions of Michael Pollan that were made in the mid noughties the late noughties. This grandmother's diet and rule of five. And, and some companies are taking this quite seriously. Some big companies are taking this quite seriously to keep uh, um, ingredient declarations very, very slim. So what uh, Innocent are doing uh, in terms of their plant-based milks, uh, you, you, you can't complain about sort of ground almonds and spring water and a bit of salt. That, that's it, three ingredients. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it doesn't meet some of the other criteria that we're talking about, like micronutrient profile or whatever, but you, you have to say it does meet this, this critical uh, kitchen-friendly rule of five thing. So clean label, no chemicals. Yeah, that, that's another thing. Um, free from allergens, well, uh, tick for uh, beyond, cross for soy in uh, impossible. That's a choice that they make. Um, and then we've got this cost thing, the commodities versus specialities. But but under sustainability, I think what's going to happen is, and I am aware of producers, let's say, based in the UK, who are going, hoping to be taking at some point this year, bringing to market um, locally grown, let's say, legumes uh, that they process into into uh, enriched protein, flowers, isolates or concentrates, whatever. Um, and that could be, that will be a good thing. If it's, if it's possible to, to have a supply chain that goes halfway yeah. around the world, it's also possible to rethink that and, and, and keep it within country. Yeah, got it. Okay. So that, that, that will help. But look, I, I, it's going to take five or 10 years to get this where it needs to be. Um, and it's not from the, some of the things I'm mentioning here on, 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 on as a challenge for improvement, which is a slide I drew up last autumn after some deep reflection. Um, not all aspects of that benchmarking are going to be possible. Uh, and so, like, if you're like innocent and your plant based milk, you just go on the rule of three and you do it that way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it will stand or fall on its simplicity. Um, a burger is more complicated. It's going to need more than three ingredients, but does it need 20? Yeah, Probably not. understood. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so you expect to see the ingredient lists of these sort of burgers gradually changing over the course of the next five to ten years? Yeah, I mean, look, there's, there's one other thing I should, should just mention in, in terms of macronutrient profile. There's no fibre or carbohydrate in, in, in beef, period. True, true. Very <laughs> difficult when you're yeah. making a plant-based alternative. Once you start seeing starch on the label, and we all know why it's there, to give yeah. it some texture and some uh, adhesion to make your um, – paste handleable or to make it turn a whole load of stuff into a paste and make it handleable and sliceable and depositable. We understand all that, uh, but, but you're starting to see things in your ingredient declaration that don't form any reasonable part of, of, of the, the, the meat 
um, alternative. And my reason for saying this is another way, if, if you take your, uh, you know, why not just use yellow split peas whole? Rather than go down this route of, of fractionating them into starch, fiber, okay. and protein, and, yeah. and because that, that that then is processing, it's difficulty, it's all the rest of it. Um, the problem is that, of course, if you try and use them whole, you're in a fixed ratio of I don't know whatever the fiber level is, and then there'll be quite a high level of starch, thirty thirty odd percent or whatever, and then there's going to be the protein in there. Yeah, so you're going to have a high carb burger basically. <laughs> exactly, but at, at the at the benefit of Zippo processing. And if that pea starch that's on board can duplicate for the other starches and maltodextrins you're adding, it can lead to some sort of simplification. Okay. But I can tell you, when you're a food developer and you're in <clears throat> you're in the development lab, you actually have all these bottles in front of you with all of these ingredients, and you 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 create something out of those ingredients. You don't think, ah, if I'm adding protein, starch, and fiber individually, why don't I just start with ground beans? You don't think that way. Because that's not how food developers in a lab for packaged products think. That's not how they work. Okay. No, no, I understand that. So it's really going to be up to one or two more creative companies to set the demand for that kind of thing. And then all the other people will just follow along once the ingredients have become available. I'm, I'm really fascinated by this, this idea of you know, using the split peas in their whole form because that makes intuitive sense. But as you say, you, you then end up with a, a product which has – a fairly high level of, of carbohydrate, which meat doesn't bring. And some people will be fine with that. Some people are very positive, see that in a very positive way. And I guess a lot of vegans and vegetarians do. But yeah, the, the, but if the protein level is lower, I mean, I'm looking at the, the Beyond Meat Burger, and it's something like 20 grams of protein compared to 29 grams for meat, you know, per, per yes. 100 grams. Yes. Yes. So, so you, despite all this processing, they still can't match the amount of protein that you would find in the animal protein source. And it's also a protein which has a lower amino acid profile. The, so the solution to the sustainability and the processing question is use more vegetables in their natural form. That makes perfect sense. I think a lot of people would like that. But then you're going to have, have an even lower ratio of protein yeah, between I mean, the plant-based one and the animal-based one. So what you're saying is it's a constant trade-off, isn't it? So at the moment, the idea of creating something which perfectly mimics what animal protein gives you so you can get the same benefits but avoid eating the animals which does matter to some people or matters Indeed. to people one day a week that's just not possible right now and it's going to be a lot quite a road before you get to can get anywhere near that point so yeah, just turning up the nutrition facts on um, yellow split peas uh, raw from usda u.s department of agriculture fat one percent that's quite handy because that, that's something you don't have to then refine out the way like you do with the soybean yeah um but you, you're talking typically the 60% carbohydrate, uh, and you're talking 25% protein. So you've got that fixed ratio. Now, I was looking at uh, an Israeli producer called Chick P uh, a few weeks back, and um, they've got some quite nice, what they claim to be functional um, isolates led by a dietetic professor. That may be good. But their low protein, um, sort of 50% concentrate, was said to be the best jelly. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be the protein, would it? That will be the cooked starch. So there are benefits. Oh, you can, yeah, yeah. So you yeah. can get so the, when you've got a mixture, which is masquerading as what is is is, is the problem. It might be that delicate, you know. Um, and of course, this is the way the bakery industry have gone by dependency on uh, in, on uh, starch providers. Instead of a proper egg custard, you mm. have a starch-based custard, mm. which is actually paste. Mm. Okay, um, it can be quite good, but uh, it can be yellow and it can taste of egg and all the rest of it. But it won't have that light, delicate gel texture of a great egg custard. Okay. Um, you, so that's the sort of thing you would you'd buy in your normal mainstream supermarket now. It doesn't really have egg in it. It's got some well, so, potato starch the, or something. Certainly the stuff they put inside Danish pastries. I mean, maybe if you do buy an egg custard, um, yeah. it, it's a little bit more, may have some egg in it, but I don't have to check the label. But, um, the stuff that's put inside it is filling, bakery filling, or bakery cream as it's called. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big industry in bakery cream. It, it, it's just basically you know, starch-based yellow gloop that they pump in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, okay, there's a big industry. The point is, there's a complexity of ingredients. If you can keep them simple and not refined, and that's one way of doing it, but you yeah. will then be stuck with the nutritional ratios of macronutrients those plants present in the first place. Mm. Mm. And that, that then of itself becomes a, a, a bit of a limitation. Mm. But that could be that would be okay for people who are yeah. going meat-free once one or two days a week, 
and they're not stressing about the amount of starch or carbohydrate in their diet. But if you really want to convert lots of meat eaters across, while you might do well on taste and texture, you're going to reach a point where the meat industry can point back and say, well, this is nice, it's plant-based, but you should be aware that it's not providing as much protein, the protein is not as high quality, it's providing you with lots of carbohydrate. And depending on which country you're looking at, something like 20 or 25% of people are trying to reduce the amount of carbohydrate in their diet because of the association that it's got for many people with, with weight management. So yeah. you're kind of excluding 25% of the population relatively quickly if you go down the all-natural high-carb route. Yes, and, 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 and it would be high-carb, which is one of the reasons then you have a process to, to reduce that and, and, and give you what you really want, which is the protein. But just to recircle back and mention a point we covered earlier, nature in seeds and nuts does a great job of laying down protein in an insoluble form. Uh, even though there's protein in there, uh, your body, when you partake of this stuff, has got to, uh, to some extent, um, solubilize it and for enzymic digestion, uh, and this all takes time. Mm. Uh, whereas a pint of milk then leads to a somewhat arcane discussion of fast and slow proteins that weighs a fast protein because yeah. it doesn't clot in the stomach, whereas casein yeah. clots in the stomach and is a slow protein. But, hey, the, the point is... <laughs> That's not a discussion you have about plant proteins because no, it's, it's, normally not. Understood, it's normally understood that they aren't particularly soluble for them to be that fast. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So that's um, that's a real challenge, isn't it? Well, actually, no, it's not a challenge because people just aren't aware of these issues. They're just thinking, the average person is just thinking, protein, protein is good for me. Plant protein, I'm told, is even better for me. And there's no thinking going beyond, on beyond that. And people don't have any knowledge beyond that, do they? But I don't think people. I don't think the message about plant protein is better for me is because intrinsically plant proteins are of themselves better nutritionally. It's appealing to the guilt of meat eaters, the concerns around the problematic of wrongly stated meat gives you cancer, wrongly stated meat gives you diabetes. Yeah, all things through branch chain amino acid profile. I was reading a, a, a post on that the other day. They're quite astonishing claim. Um, and then there's people worrying about factory farming, which yes. again is well, in some you, countries it's ironic. You know, if you're buying Irish beef or Scottish beef or most of the UK, then you're buying something which has not come from any kind of factory farm. You know, there's yeah, um, and, and then there's this point about you know greenhouse gas emissions from, from mm, agriculture, which mm. Professor Frank Mitlerno does a great job of explaining what's really going on and where yeah. it sits at the profile of industry and, and yeah. aviation and transport and everything else. Everyone so, should go and look up Professor Frank Mitlerno at UC Davis, shouldn't they? Because he's a climate, no, he's a air quality scientist originally yeah. who's actually done some intelligence analysis about what happens to the famous cow burps which we're always being told are killing us and and how it's not exactly how it's been been presented over the past 10 or 15 years no and so i think well, yeah so coming back, circling back to okay plant proteins are good for you i'm not sure that people believe plant proteins are great because of their nutritional profile i don't think it goes that it's just that they know that yeah. because meats had bad press for so long yeah. It can't possibly be about uh, greenhouse gas emissions. It can't possibly be about giving you cancer. And it can't possibly be, what was the other one we mentioned? It was, was the third thing, wasn't it, on, 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 on animal welfare? Yeah, well, animal welfare, yeah, whatever. There's, there's, there's three stories around meat which yeah. people will, will come to mind. The meat, the meat guilt pieces, that's right. Yeah. But when you delve into it, mm. nutritionally, it's not such a wonderful story. And then, then there's another huge point here. Why is it that the market is all about these meat knockoffs? Uh, when rather you mean than, burgers, <laughs> yes, <laughs> burgers rather than really yeah. good, really yeah. good plant based protein mm. uh, and bringing together really high quality protein from different plants to give you the balanced amino acid profile and, and serving up a, a dish of those. Well, I suspect that would be much more around natural products, and that's not an industry where vast amounts of, of money are made, yeah. And that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because some of the companies. You know, producing most of the companies producing the, the the burger substitutes have secured enormous investment. You know, beyond meat, five hundred million dollars, impossible five hundred million dollars. And I, I I get the impression that if you turn up to the private equity people and the venture capital people with a business plan saying I'm going to produce a highly processed multi ingredient meat substitute, they'll throw money at you. But if because they, they believe that that's some sort of competitive advantage. But if I turn up and say, you know, I'm going to make a burger just out of plant plants i'm going to use nuts i'm going to use seeds they, they don't seem to put any money behind that it's as, almost as if their belief is that something that comes from 
industrial scale agriculture and is made in a factory is somehow going to enable them to make piles of money. And they're not the least bit interested in, well, let's call it a whole food approach, not the least bit interested in backing that. No, I think I think this is the case. I mean, I was visiting a company again at the end of um, 2019, a company called Aduna based in London, quite a small company, and they're, they're trading in interesting things from, from West Africa. And, and one product they got, which was uh, quite interesting, was was uh, uh, Moringa, uh, green super leaf powder, or whatever you make. Oh, super. yes, yeah. But the point we want to make about and Moringa... Just for clarity, that's come that comes from a plant which is grown in India and parts of Africa, isn't it? Yes. What we've got is a leaf here. 6% fat, 24% fiber, and 26% carbs. And the fiber will be mostly cellulose as being a leaf, but 25% protein. That's that's quite good for mm. a uh, plant based leaf. Yeah. Now, what the quality of that protein is, I haven't made an analysis, but that struck me as a very interesting product. Remember, it's a green powder and can be put into shakes or whatever you you, you choose to choose to consume it as, yeah. as a dry powder. Yeah. But Aduna are really, really careful about their supply chain, so it's not contaminated, and it has to be certified and signed off. Yeah. So these other sources, new alternative sources like Moringa, do you see them becoming more important relative to things like yellow split pea and soy? Well, oh, that they should be, of course, because it's yeah. this. This is just a natural. Uh, what we're talking about here is a natural powder from a high protein leaf that, that is available. It's not formulated; it's, it's yeah. a basic ingredient. Um, the problem, and if you're buying it straight from Africa or India, you may even be doing something for for communities there as well. And indeed, Aduna have such a profile in, in terms of uh, um, corporate and social responsibility. Right. Um, but there are many. Uh, this is, of course, leads us back to the discussion of monoculture compared to what's really happened. Many of our um, uh, monocrops have become much reduced in the vibrancy of their nutritional profile. And to look at something like Moringa is actually quite interesting. I mean, there's, a, there's actually a long list of vitamins in it. A, E, K, C, B1, uh, B12, potassium, calcium, magnesium, iron, and zinc. Are all so it's coming this, uh, with a natural nutrient package indeed. that you don't get when you're buying an isolated um, pea protein or an isolated soy protein. Yeah, I mean, and, and you could then say, well, why not put a shovel full of that in your burger? Uh, that's fine, only the problem will be chlorophyll because you end up with green burgers. And, and, and that's... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I'm sure there's some market for that. Yeah, but yeah. So, so effectively, well, you'd have to find a natural way of changing the colour so that people didn't have green burgers, basically. Well, yeah, and, and of course, then we're then we're down to free processing again. What's going to happen is the market will start off attempting to get the plant-based oh, meat, meats market, and then another day perhaps we'll discuss the milks market. But the, the 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 meat market is going to start off with having to match texture and taste to get the consumers having to buy a product again. Um, and all of this other detailed worry about supply chains, complexity, chemicals, allergens, and all the rest of it, that comes later. And some of them have already got a position on that. But simplifying the ingredient inventory, um, turning away from the more chemical derivatives um, has to be a challenge. Uh, less ingredients, easier to uh, manage your warehouse stock and your inventory. And... The, as I said already, many NPD people will have bottles of all this stuff in front of them, which they readily select from. And if you could start from a different place altogether, you'd come up with a different product. And I suspect that may not be uh, an analogue of a burger. Okay. So what's what's this going to be if it's not an analogue of a burger then? Well, I mean, look, the mor moringa leaf and whatever can be a spoonful for a shake, but I mean, that doesn't, that, that you, we're, right. we're, we're back on the fringes of milks then, aren't we? We're not really yeah. talking about, we're not really talking about. Or you could add these things into other sorts of meals altogether. I mean, why wouldn't you have, instead of a burger, which seems to be the obsession, we just seem to have said burger 10,000 times in the past, yeah. however long, why not have ready meals, which are plant-based, which are obviously you know about plants, but you happen to have added the plant protein in the form of, let's take this moringa powder, for example, so it gives you the dose of protein, but it, it fits within something where the overall taste is you know, familiar as Asian flavors or or... Italian flavour or whatever, wouldn't wouldn't that be a better approach to look yes, at I whole mean, meals? A sort, I mean, a simple leaf powder as a source enhancer with the starch in it would do quite well. I would have thought because then your protein is being delivered as part of the, the meal source. So why not? Just okay. a few beans in there and, uh, and whatever, off you go. In fact, yeah. I I started some of my original application studies with um, high performing plant based protein, highly functional by 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 using sort of bean soups uh, as a substrate. And, mm. and 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 using using the uh, gelling behaviour of the um, plant-based protein to to gel and produce a quiche, which uh -huh. it did. 
right. Right. So, uh, you know, uh, as a quiche running, and I've got photographs of that. We're talking about autumn 2008, I think. Yeah. Um, I would have photographs of that at the time. And that, that was to, to prove that it's actually possible to make something that's non-meat based with this material that would appeal to uh, people who prefer to eat plants, of which there are some. Mm. Yeah. Oh, very good. But it's the earliest studies. Yeah. Thank you very much, Paul. That was that was complex. But fascinating. I've certainly learned a lot. I think I'm going to spend a little time still trying to understand what I think think I've learned. So thank you very much for giving up your time to talk about this difficult subject. Julian, a pleasure indeed. Uh, and uh, maybe it has uh, un- uncorked a lot of uh, loose ends that we, we perhaps need to tie off or whether you get feedback on these things to, to give you a sense of where the stress lays from that. That's something we could possibly come back and, and look at again. Yes, it's been a pleasure to talk to you about this. It, it, it's The problem is... The hubris in them makes a lot of very, very wild claims. And yet in product terms, uh, it's very clear due to the costs, the complexity and some of the other challenges that some simplification and some improvement will be needed over the coming years. But as for supplanting the meat market, a bit too early to say. Okay, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to listen to someone who unlike anybody else who comments on this market, actually understands the science and how the product is made and the nutritional profile. You're kind of like a a one in a million voice. And that's why you've been here today, because your voice, people who actually know what they're talking about, never gets heard. So thank you very much for for sharing that with us. Thank you very much, Julian. Maybe we'll do another on on another uh, asset of this uh, complex area. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, we will. We will. (laughs) 